Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. I sort of am very open to to new ways of expressing myself. And because that story was one I knew really, really well. Yes. And because I felt I knew the medium I was trying to slot it into pretty well. The pressure was the, my own pressure, which is of how I get this, how do I get this to something I truly believe in? And that's a different pressure. That's the kind of creative pressure. That's to do with being completely in my space and recognizing where, you know, when I, when I believe it and when I don't. Today, I'm talking to Rachel Joyce, an award-winning novelist and playwright. Over the course of a 20-year career as an actor, performing leading roles for the RSC, National Theatre and Cheek by Jowl, she was always writing. Alongside radio drama, she also wrote the Sunday Times and international bestsellers, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry and The Love Song of Miss Queenie Hennessy. Her latest novel, Maureen Fry and the Angel of the North, completes the trilogy. Rachel is also the author of the bestsellers Perfect, The Music Shop and Miss Benson's Beetle. Her books have sold over 5 million copies worldwide and been translated into 36 languages. The unlikely pilgrimage of Harold Fry was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize, long listed for the Man Booker Prize, and is now a major film for which Rachel wrote the screenplay, starring Jim Broadbent and Penelope Wilton, due for release in April 2023. In this conversation, she shares why she found herself crying on the beach, what helps her feel 30 foot tall and 30 foot wide, and the power of an unspoken contract. Rachel, hello. Thank you so much for joining me on Better Under Pressure. It's a pleasure. It's lovely to see you. You too. So, tell me about pressure. Tell me when you first, do you have a memory of first experiencing pressure? I think, oh gosh, I think I experience it almost on a daily, (laughs) daily basis. And I'd say it's to do with being creative and wanting to get it out you know to kind of to communicate it so one of my earliest memories of pressure is being it's either nine or eleven depending on how old Daisy Ashford was (laughs) when she had her novel The First Visitors published and I remember crying on the beach I don't remember where this beach was but crying on a beach because I was nine or eleven and I hadn't yet written my first book. Blimey. Yeah. So that need, you know, not just to, to write and to write a story, but to get it out and have it published was sort of, was really strong, even then as a child. Gosh. Yes. And also that the reaction was one of tears. Yeah. You know, because you can talk to someone who said, who might get an, realization that they want to be something like I can remember wanting to be a teacher at a very young age and I also all... wanted to do that oh yes. did you yeah yes. and I can remember lining up you know every single sort of doll teddy everything and they were my imaginary class and I but I don't but that desire to be a teacher um didn't produce tears I'm really interested in the fact that 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 desire that that complete yearning yeah. It was a sort of sadness on some level. Was it I sad think it or was it more tears? than a sadness. I think it was more, uh, which I think is behind creativity. It was more of a rage. It's more of a frustration. Uh, it's uh, so it's not a kind of it, it's it's not a kind of downward falling thing. It was more of a you know how, how why haven't I done it? Um, so it was a very um, it was a passionate response. I would yes. say to it, and it's kind of recognizing even at nine or 11, that that is in you, that need to communicate in that way. Yeah. And so what did you do with that extreme sensation? Well, the truth is that I'd already written my autobiography. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah. So, uh, and uh, that was about my poetry, which I felt had not been recognised either. <laughs> so it's about how brilliant my poetry was. Uh, but what I think I, I did do was I just, I, I kept writing. And I did, by the time I was about 12 or 13, try to get something published. So I didn't tell anyone. Went to West Norwood Library, found out who were publishers. And I sent off my book secretly it was a it was a story it was a story it was a children's story uh and I think I had a kind of assumed name because I thought that might make my chances stronger do you remember the and, name uh, I didn't tell anyone and then I had my letter of rejection to the name that you'd made up yeah but that letter uh addressed to me yeah, and I really thought of that, in fact, when I got my first publishing deal all those years later. I really thought of that, well, that 9-11 year old crying on the beach and then the the one who tried to send a story off and, fa- and had experienced that rejection. You still and have that letter? I don't think I do. And that's 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 strange for me because I'd have thought I would have done, but no, I don't think I do. Mm. But it's a very strong memory. Exactly. In a way, I don't need it. I know. No, no. Yeah. Gosh. So what's already interesting is this desire, this passion, how you sat with it. And you became incredibly um, determined. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think I, I always was, but in the ter- in terms of writing, in, ter- in terms of recognising that it was something I needed to do, uh-huh. that actually a person, as a person without it, I wasn't fully expressing myself, that it mm. was, it was something that had to be done. And, um, you know, I, I am quite a quiet person and I could easily go to a dinner party. I'm one of those people who can go to a dinner party and if I don't say anything within the first half hour, that's it you just feel there's no inroad here you know I can go I can go away having said nothing and I think I felt that very much as a child and I felt it as a teenager that there was I had a lot more to say than I ever said so writing was the only way I really found to express who I was gosh and and then what's fascinating about that is that you then ended well you you began to to act yes but so acting is similar yeah. to writing. They are similar, you know, there's there's very similar muscles. And I think I loved the theater as a as a child and as a young woman. I still do. Mm-hmm. But it is a place of storytelling. I mean, it is, mm-hmm. you know, it's and it's a place where it's a kind of sacred space where anything can happen. And I feel a book is the same when you open it. Um, but it's a very creative, imaginary, uh, it kind of it a process that involves the imagination as an actor and it's exactly the same to being a writer so even though I continued to write I did train as an actor and then worked as an actor for 20 years but I continued to write all the way through right but again it was that feeling that I stand on stage and people actually listen to who I am Mm -hmm. Even though I'm I'm borrowing else, it seems to somebody else's words, or I'm borrowing somebody else, I have a voice. Yeah, through reading somebody else's writing and bringing yeah. it off the page. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But you know, through becoming it. Yes. So, so in this journey of recognizing an ex- a very very strong desire that actually you were not going to ignore. No. In fact, you were very determined all the way through. What can you just talk about where why you went from writing to acting? And then obviously, you know, you've come right round again back to being yeah. a full full writer. But what took you off the path of writing into acting? I think because at the time I wasn't ready to show anyone what I wrote. It was that it was that simple. And because right. I was so passionate about theatre, um because as I was trying to say, it was this place where I felt I came alive. You know, I would go to a play as a young person and the play would still be more real to me afterwards than going to school or 
uh, you know, whatever else I had to do. I would, I would go home after a play. I would be reading the play. I would be pretending I was in the play. I'd be pouring over the programs. I was in that place where actually the imaginary world was more fulfilling in a way than, than my real one. Right. So, so, and, and I think I probably also just was confident on stage in a way I wasn't in my kind of normal life. Mm-hmm. So I I think probably what people felt when I when I auditioned or when or when I went on stage was this like I'm saying this need to be heard. Yeah, I think it's quite compelling when you meet people who have it because you can't yes. quite put your fingers on it, but you know something's going on that you can't fathom, and so there's a story in there that you want to get into. I think a lot of actors have it. So it was it was a very easy switch to make, you know, kind of go to following the acting. And it was one that was really fulfilling. I loved being an actor as a young, as a young woman. Mm-hmm. And I loved being amongst actors. Um, but I was never part of the sort of that idea of this sort of extrovert social scene. That was just never my thing. So I would always slope off afterwards. Um but the creative process of being in a rehearsal room, I loved. And uh, that moment where you kind of go on stage and you sort of sometimes felt, it didn't always happen, but sometimes I could walk on stage and I could feel I am as big as this theatre. I am 30 feet tall and 30 feet wide and I will speak. And then sometimes it just wasn't there at all and you just have to, you have to get through it. Yeah, so let's talk about that, Jessica. So, oh gosh, there's so many things in there that I want to pick up. <laughs> I, first of all, like, like so often I'm talking to leaders, Rachel, and they are, yeah. you know, presenting or standing in front of an audience is the worst part of their job. Or they yeah. don't, or it brings out all sorts of pressure that they haven't experienced in other parts of their week, for example. And you're what you're yeah. saying there is the complete reverse. It's like, you know, actually, when you get, get me on stage and I'm as big as the stage and more um there must be a process that enables you so you sort of said it you tailed it off then when you said you know and if it sometimes it doesn't and then you just have to get through it but what is so yeah. what I'm really fascinated uh, as you know with um performing yeah. arts generally but particularly this this ability to perform and what is the what can we learn from the process that allows someone to just get through it like you just said just get on with it <laughs> what what <laughs> what do you do to to shift yourself into that gear when you have to do you know I, I don't completely know I mean I think there is what I'm talking about that moment of feeling that big is a slightly magic serendipitous moment that happens between you and the audience often mm. somebody said to me recently about film writing but I think it's true of making a speech or of writing a book that there is a moment very early on between you and the audience or you and the reader where you make a contract and you say to the audience don't worry sit tight, wherever you go, you've got a safety belt, but I'm going to take you to some good places or some bad places, but we're going on a journey. But it's kind of the contract and somehow the nature of the contract is written in very, very early, you know, kind of, if it's a film, say you're going to, you're kind of going to establish what the nature of the film is, what kind of experience you're about to have. It's just that moment of reassuring people that in a way you are in control that they're safe, mm. uh, but that things are going to happen. And I, I suppose that comes from being prepared. Yes. You know, being able to deliver yeah. that to people. Um, you know, really, really feeling that you know, you know, you know your stuff. Yeah. Uh, something you talk about a lot, that you're not tired. I increasingly think you mustn't be tired. Um, and then, I mean, on stage, it's something slightly different, I think, to when you're giving a speech, because on stage, you're sort of, there are moments that you can't account for, mm. that just, you you kind of go, you, you mean, you can look at the actors around you, and I think that's the other thing that's different, that you're often, you're in a performance, you know, so you're yes. with other actors, but you suddenly look around and you think, my God, we're going, we're just, we're in it. And when people are truly in it, I think they're truly in the moment and they're not afraid. 
So it's how you get yourself to the place where you're not afraid. Yes. How do you do that? How do you, well, Rachel, do that? Yes. Well, I, I think it's, I mean, my, when I give now performances, the only thing I can liken it to is when I do a book event, say, you know, when I have to talk about my writing. So I'm presenting myself to an mm -hmm. audience. Mm. And how I get to a place of kind of feeling confidence is, well, is it's a number of things. Again, not being tired, being quite focused. I now recognize that if I've, often with book events, um, if you're part of a festival, there will be a num number of other book events happening, you know, before yours, especially if they're before yours. Be very careful, I now realize, how many book events you go to before you deliver your own. Because with all the kind of, you know, I kind of go to things and I think I really want to hear so-and-so talking, I really want to hear so-and-so talking. But I've realized that what it does is it completely throws me off my, who am I? And oh. you can then go to a book event, which I've done, the worst book event I've ever, ever done was when I went, having been to three other book events first, and I was tired, I also had begun to think, I don't think I'm a writer. I don't think I'm as good a writer as those other writers who were speaking earlier. And I need people to make me feel that I'm a writer. And that, I think, is the moment where I denied that contract I was talking about earlier. I did not make people feel, hang on in there, you're safe, we're gonna go on a journey because actually I needed them to make me feel I was a writer. And it and it 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 just created very, very quickly an atmosphere that was really uncomfortable for me. It was very uncomfortable for the audience. And I knew I was not in control. And I came off stage and cried, really cried. What a perfect example of the chain we can all get caught in. This is what can happen when we ignore what we know would set us up for success and consequently deny ourselves a chance to create that strong, unspoken contract that Rachel talks about. In her description of how she felt in that situation, she emphasises a few valuable ingredients though, which others have actually touched on too in other episodes, to remain better under pressure. She reminds us, get enough sleep. I loved it when Rachel said, I increasingly think I mustn't be tired. Feeling prepared, really, really knowing that you know your stuff. Interestingly, I was speaking to a QC recently about how he manages pressure, and he replied, being better prepared than anyone else in that court. Eliminate comparison. Gosh, it's debilitating. And if we don't control it, it can very quickly impact our sense of self-worth. Have a self-talk, a mantra that reminds you of your strengths and you at your best. And finally, have ways to connect to your cheerleaders. This could be, as Abby Stevens shared in an earlier episode, your inner cheerleader, or as Paula McKenzie reminded us, if they aren't there, know that you can call on them, dead or alive. So from that experience, you shifted, it, sent, it sounds like you shifted the sense of power or where you believed the power was. Yeah, I did. Oh, and so, how does how did you i'm just i love this so much because i think what you're talking about here is so fundamental and it's sometimes so difficult to get under the surface of that contract that you're talking about you know mm -hmm. it, it happens in seconds doesn't it it's like yeah. and you know it when you're a member of an audience because you can think yep i believe this person already i'm yeah. gonna sit back i'm gonna belt up i am going to really listen yeah. and be taken on this yeah. journey because i totally trust you've got it the it's minute trust. you sniff that you yeah. they don't have it it's yeah. deeply uncomfortable as an audience member. Terribly. It's like going to a play and the moment somebody forgets their lines. Yes. <gasps> it's it's that awful moment of unease because you feel responsible for them so that the magic's gone. Yeah. The storytelling is gone. And suddenly, you know, it's you, Sarah, or it's me, Rachel, thinking, God, how can we help? Yes. So the, the whole thing has gone. And it's such a fine it's such a fine thing that is created anyway, this kind of, um, or this sort of enchantment or magic or whatever it is, that place where one person speaks and a whole room for, you know, a load yes. of people listen. Yes. 
and you can feel it. You're right in that contract moment. It's split seconds, isn't it? But yeah. it's so yeah. powerful. And it, as an audience member, you can feel it that it's got yeah. that sort of um, connection between the audience yeah. in in service to what we're about to do together, <laughs> go on together. I think I always think of. Um, I know I've told you about this before, but my when I was acting. Um, I was working with Margaret Tyzak, who was a formidable actress. And I remember her saying to me when I was in rehearsals and I was feeling a bit like I hadn't got the part and I couldn't get it. And she and she said to me, always come to work in a good heel. And what she meant was make a noise. You know, you feel you're not you feel nobody's listening to you or you feel you're not here. Gosh. Wear a pair of shoes that don't kind of creep into the room you know, kind of claim your space. Mm. And it was quite, you know, trying to claim your space with Maggie Tyzak was was quite <laughs> something. But I've always thought of that. Um, and, and I've kind of taken it now as I don't always want to wear loud, noisy shoes. But I do think about what I'm wearing very, very carefully. And yeah. is this, the you know, just the way I'm presenting myself, is this the comfortable, is this how I'm comfortable? You know, this is, is this how, the look that I'm giving you is this connecting right through to what I want to feed you? Oh, I love that, Rachel. And I think it's not talked about enough, actually, is that sense of what you put on and the impact it has on the way you feel about yeah. yourself and what you're bringing into a room. Yeah. Um, and I love that because actually you're talking about it not just as a I mean, I'm hearing it in terms of costume as a character. But I'm hearing about costume as getting into Rachel yeah. <laughs> as to really feeling the strength of Rachel. Yeah, I, I completely. I think if I'm doing a book event, I do think very carefully about what I'm wearing, even if it looks as if I've just thrown something on, then mm. that's the decision I've made that day. Yes. But I want to look like somebody who's just thrown something on. And maybe that is the look I want that day, but it's, yes. it's chosen so that you're in, you know, you're in control of it. Yeah. Yeah. And is that a technique? And I'm saying technique. I'm using that as a as a hold holding statement, really, because I'm I don't want to undo what I think is the richness in that. But is that part of how you were talking earlier about shifting the locus of control away from an external force, be it other um, authors speaking to you? Um, is that is that part of that journey? This. Choosing. Yes, I think it is. I mean, I think the curious thing about being a writer now is that, um, or if you're a published writer, is that you are expected to write, and that in itself is a pressure every day. That you know, the pressure of the blank page, and can I do it? That that's all that one pressure. But there is also now, which we all experience in different ways, this kind of pressure to present ourselves. You know, we have to go on book talks we have to sell our work really that's what we're doing we're selling it mm -hmm. but it mustn't look as if we're selling it <laughs> because that doesn't seem sincere yeah. so it's how do I appear sincere while also protecting the part of myself that can't be sincere to yes. a load of people I don't know yes and that when I you know when I did that event that went wrong we got too close to stuff that was too personal for me and not presented in a way that was you know kind of it it, it, it the audience picked up that it was yeah. not sorted so it was uncomfortable yes. for them yes yes yeah, so that's back to your preparation point as well isn't it is is understanding what you choose to talk about and what you want it's to talk what you about. choose to talk about but also that if you're not I, because I was tired I think looking back, I did that terrible thing, which you do when you're kind of driving away from something that hasn't gone well, when you're just, you, yeah. you know, you're reliving the whole thing with much, much better answers. Um, but I <laughs> think afterwards, if only it would have been fine if I had answered it with wit, but wit requires you not to be tired. Mm. And, you know, I could have said, I don't think I should answer that question. It's so personal that if I do, I'll have to marry you all, you know, something like that. And you just, you go, no, we're not going there, but you make it funny. So again, people relax yeah. and they kind of don't feel, oh God, we've gone to an area that's difficult for her. And now we're all stuck in the mire and she can't talk about it. And now we feel bad. And how are we going to get out of this? Yeah. Gosh, it's such a good point. Yeah. I love that connection you've made there between 
wit, the the ability to have almost the cognitive capacity to turn something into uh, something else requires some fuel, doesn't it? It requires something in your tank. And if you haven't got it, it's a much harder effort. Yeah. Totally. It is. And, And I also love that other point you made, Rachel, about deciding that actually you're going to stop going to visit other other also speaking events you know because it wasn't becoming it was losing I my I so relate to that I mean uh, having you know written one published book I can mm-hmm. I in preparation for that I was ordering every single book that I thought would be in a similar area that, that to, to the shed method you know and, and I got to the point where I just completely lost my way mm-hmm. and I remember saying to Chris right that's it take all of these books away from me I don't want any more books I need to sit with what's in me. And I think this, and whether it's a book or whether it's people um, or whether it's something, you know, whatever it is, I think sometimes we can overcrowd ourselves with other people's point Mm. of view. Yes. In such a way that you lose what yours is. Yeah. I I think it happens very easily, especially if you're at some kind of uh, festival or series where there are a number of talks. Yes. And it's nothing to do with not being interested in other people or or kind of wanting to know what they have to say. It's just to do with protecting your own voice and also recognizing that if you're presenting yourself, it's not just as simple as turning up and asking answering some questions about yourself. No. no. It's, it's finer than that. And it's taken me a long time to realize that. And uh, you know, well, who knows. Well, you and uh, most of the human race, I think, Rachel, because I mean, in my world, when I'm when I'm working with leaders who have got what what we call sort of moments that matter or critical impact opportunities, and it might involve sitting, going to speak into a front of an audience. It's like often they haven't carved enough time to give it the thought, the preparation, the sleep, the fuel that's required to actually really optimize that moment. So I think. You know, you're making a very, very important point, I think, for all of us, is that when do we recognise those moments and how do we really honour them? Yeah. I think as well, because we're all <clears throat> under, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not very present, but social media as well is such a kind of vehicle for people to appear, you know, to present themselves. And certainly as writers, there is a suggestion that it would be good if you were, you know, you had a presence on. And and I'm, I mean, I'm lucky that I've said no and it's been okay that I've said no because I know how much damage something like Twitter would do me. Yeah. Uh, I know how hard I would find it to sort of keep reading about other writers on Instagram, you know, showing me their new books and how terribly successful they all are. You know, it's, I can see that it it would, it would throw me off my place. Yeah. And also that in presenting yourself, I mean, I do try to do Instagram and, um, but um, my attitude to it has become playful. Same and well. I think that's something I kind of gone back to my old acting days, uh, you know, and that and how much I love being in a rehearsal space where it seems to me creativity is always about being playful, you know, not being afraid, trying things out, making mistakes. But that's OK, just going down all the avenues. I mean, a bit like you with your book, possibly. I mean, maybe you did need to read a load of other things in order to then go, do you know what? No, I now listen to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that is, I think I'm learning that that is part of my process of preparation for anything. And I remember even, you know, at university having books open half, like if anyone had walked in, it was not an organized space. And and I would dip in and out and it, it was cluttered. It really was a cluttered process. And even now, if I'm going for a, you know, to, if I'm asked to talk, I have lots of tabs open. I have lots of things open. There's, and then there comes a point where I go, right, that's it. Don't need any more input. Because we are, we have so much opportunity for input, don't we? Yeah. Sources of input into us. Yeah. Um, that I think that probably, yeah, I think you're right. I think there is a moment for me where I go, enough. Yeah. Um. So interesting. So 
just thinking about where your career has gone, Rachel, and mm. the different amounts of pressure it's brought with it, you're now turning Harold Fry or have done into a film. What was it like? What was the pressure like going from an author into a, you know, making a film? What's the, was there anything significant about the pressure increase on that? Though I would say there wasn't really a significant uh, increase it because it's, but that's only because I welcome change okay. within my writing, you know, like the sphere. Because I've written for radio as well, and, uh, you know, I've tried to write poetry, but not very successfully, it, apart from when I was eight, obviously. Um, I sort of am very open to to new ways of expressing myself. And because that story was one I knew really, really well. Yes. And because I felt I knew the medium I was trying to slot it into pretty well, the pressure was the, my own pressure, which is of how I get this how do I get this to something I truly believe in? And that's a different pressure. That's the kind of creative pressure. And that is to do with nothing to do with being public or, you know, at, at outward or extrovert. That's to do with being completely in my space and recognizing where, you know, when I, when I believe it and when I don't. Yeah. And for me, that's the real, real work that I do. It's, you know, deeply private and probably kind of difficult to even explain to anyone. Yeah. And um, very, it involves me kind of really disappearing for a period just to really be with something. And how do you manage that with, because I, I think, again, making a connection to to the leaders that we work with, those leaders that maybe know that that private space is incredibly important to them and it's part of their brilliance to have mm -hmm. it, it's hugely compromised for them often, A, in the system in which they work, but also because yeah. the more senior you become, the more people you have to lead. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there's any connection in that for you in terms of you with your writing is a you and a writing process, you know, you it's it's a it feels like a very private magical space yeah. to 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 be in. When you go and make a film, just by its very nature, there are so many more people involved in creating mm -hmm. that magic. Yeah. How does someone who needs their private space manage that? Yes, and no, I don't know that I managed it completely successfully because it was so new for me, certainly being on a film set. And what yes. I really noticed of myself is that I do, I'm very, very sensitive to other people's energies. And I think it's probably why I write. Mm. And I think I pick up things very, very quickly that I feel quite tenderly. I mean, I, I probably see weaknesses and areas that people feel insecure but I'm not good at separating myself from them so my in that period of being involved in the film work even though I was really an observer because there was no writing to be done I you know I, or I was there as a kind of looker after of the film I ended up feeling like I had tiny burn marks all over me from all the people the kind of burden really of all the people that I'd witnessed. Gosh. And I found it exhausting. And uh, yeah, that I, when I came back home, I, I, I kind of thought I really need to again, just disappear a while for a while now. Yeah. I once had a client who would metaphorically wrap herself in bubble wrap when she went into a particular meeting to protect herself from two or three individuals and the impact that they had on her. Mm. <laughs> and I sort of, I'm getting that image for you, Rachel, you know, you know, the gift of feeling other people in order to how it, in, in terms of what it enables you to do creatively is a, yeah. it feels like a real gift, yeah. but like any gift, there's always that rawness to it, isn't there? When you're put into a different context or situation that's yeah. what it sounds like here. Like you, you yeah. can't suddenly stop that 
coming in. No, and I think the problem is that when you are not, I mean, I call it wearing a coat. And I have a friend of mine who says the same thing. We say, have you got your coat on today? Yeah, yeah. We mean, you know, like, are you, are you prepared? Are you protected? Yes. Because I think if you're not, the problem is that you become worn down and then you start reacting a little bit, I mean, not in a paranoid way, but you can sort of slightly begin to imagine that people are thinking things or feeling things that they may not be. You're overreacting to things. And I did, again, I noticed, it's just like the balance had gone. Yeah. So I think your emotional bubble wrap or whatever it is. Yes. Is The other thing I now think to myself sometimes when I go into those situations is, okay, well, I have chosen to come into this. So because it's my choice, I'm going to do it with grace. Mm. And I've thought a lot about grace. You know, even when I'm I'm about I'm about to do an event this evening and there's going to be somebody there I know who's going to be tricky. Right. And last night I was getting wound up thinking, I know this person is going to be there. I know they're going to be tricky. And just this morning I said to myself, well, they are going to be there. So don't react you know don't kind of just just take it in and respond in a generous way don't go you know don't feel the barb lovely and of course that's so much easier to do when you're well rested isn't it (laughs) and you've got your coat on and you've got your coat on we all have tricky people in our life And tricky people can impact our ability to be better when we're around them, particularly if we're sensitive to other people's energies, like Rachel. Whilst this can be valuable, every strength has a shadow. And for Rachel, it's the capacity to, as she describes, overreact. When we recognize our tendencies in pressure moments, it's vital to have a pressure practice. This is a practice we have created outside of the pressure to apply when we feel or anticipate pressure. Rachel's example is exactly this. To prevent her from being oversensitive to other people's energies, she does two things. One, has a metaphorical coat that she puts on to protect herself. And two, has a very useful self-talk. She says, I've chosen to come into this, and so because it's my choice, I'm going to do this with grace. This tricky person is going to be there, so take it in and respond in a generous way. Choose to ignore the barb. Love that. Back to Rachel's pay forwards. Um, This is the point of the podcast where the guest has an opportunity to just pass forward two pieces of advice. If there's somebody listening to you, either wanting to be a writer or dealing with pressure or just wanting to be better under pressure, what would you offer them? What would be your first pass forward? Uh, Well, oh dear. I mean, uh, in terms of being a writer, my advice is always, well, I have two pieces of advice, if you don't mind, if you want to be a writer. But one is that you just have to keep practicing. Mm. Like, you you know, you wouldn't be an athlete and kind of go out there onto the track without having trained every day. So that's the same with writing. But the other thing is that as a writer, I think there are so many now um, kind of like, you know, there's kind of social media or courses online, so many places telling you that you need to do this, you need to do that. And what they don't allow you to do is actually to listen to yourself. And I really feel that in order to be a writer, you have to make the space in yourself to be a writer. And you have to honor that space that wants to be a writer. So you have to recognize how it is that you're going to become one. And if it means that you need to go and create a tiny space in your house where you write and nobody else does, then that's what it is. If you have to get up at five because your children, which is what kind of happened to me, my children were all there. So I woke up early because that was my thinking time. But I began to learn how I needed to work as a writer and nobody else could give me that. The only person who could give me that permission to kind of allow myself to write was me. Love that, Rachel. And it's so transferable, I think, to whatever desire you might have in your life. Yeah. And do you have another one or are the two entwined in that response? I think they are pressure generally. In terms of in terms of pressure, I I, I, I keep going back to those moments where I feel that I have just been like a rabbit in headlights. And that's through being 
not prepared, but again, not honoring that space mm. where yeah. I'm here because somebody has asked me to be here. So this is the contract and I know what I'm doing. Love it. Oh, I so enjoyed this conversation, Rachel. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Of course, all these things are easier to say than to do, of course. Yeah, it's true. And yet, at the same time, when we can provide space to talk about it, I yeah. think so many realisations happen just in having a bit of space to talk about one thing. Yeah. And all its different guises. Yeah. I appreciate your time so much. And I hope tonight is brilliant <laughs> with or without your coat. <laughs> Thank you. Before we finish, I want to reinforce this concept that Rachel talked about of the unspoken contract. To reiterate that the nature of this contract with your audience happens very early. It's the unspoken moment when you radiate that you're in control, that everyone is safe and that you're going to take them on a journey. That you've got this. I love this point and wish it was talked about more. We feel it as an audience when we listen to people speaking and it allows us to relax and truly listen. And it's our responsibility to provide it. When an audience feels this, it creates a space to expand thinking and possibility without worrying about the speaker. This is relevant for any moment when you want to create impact. And Rachel stresses two important ingredients. Knowing you are really, really prepared and getting enough sleep. Over to you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne Rowe. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method. Alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening and until next time, goodbye.